Well, good morning, church. We're really glad you're hanging out with us again today. Welcome to church. Welcome to Union Church, whether you're at our uh, Castle campus or our Danville campus or watching online or um, maybe you're watching like three weeks later and this is back in time. I don't know, but we're glad you're here. We're in week four of um, our summer series that we're doing in the month of June on the book of Titus titled Every Good Work. And so right about almost about to wrap this thing up with this week and then next week. And then we got some cool stuff that we'll be doing in the month of July. You'll hear about that during the church service today. But um, if you want to go ahead and turn in your Bibles, we will now finally enter into Titus chapter 2. Um, so we've covered Titus chapter 1. And I don't have a time, a lot of time to go back and kind of rehash what we've done so far. So if you want to go and watch online or whatever, you feel free to do that so you can be caught up on it. But the real, the real um, push this series has been to make sure you're in the Word. And so taking time to read the book of Titus to yourself. And so hopefully by the time we finish this, you will probably have read through the book of Titus a handful of times, hopefully. Because you can read through the entire book before you leave the parking lot today in literally three and a half or four minutes. And so I want you to be reading it along with me. And so the challenge is today is not just to read it on the screens. I know some of you are screen junkies and you love to read on the screens, but try not to. Try to open up the, the Bible app or the paper Bible that you brought in with you. If you brought a paper Bible in with you, make sure you open it up. But if you don't have the Bible app, go ahead and download it real quick um, and download it and open up this particular event. And we would love to have you follow along with us with all the slides and all that kind of stuff. But reading the Word yourself is the key. Um, big, big theme for the book of Titus we talked about this a lot last week as well, is that the gospel takes root in the heart before the gospel starts to produce fruit outside of the heart. And so it starts to take root in the heart first, and then it begins to produce fruit outside the heart. Like the title of the series, Every Good Work Happens After We Understand the Good, Good Gospel of Jesus Christ. And so that's kind of a big central theme. So the, the push of the whole book, like as Paul is talking to this young pastor Titus, like in week two when we talked about uh, what elders and leaders and pastors should be, and then like last week we talked about false teachers, the whole point is, is that you've got to pay attention to what's in the heart and what we're grabbing onto, not just our actions. The actions come as a derivative of our belief. And so that's the whole point of the book. And so I want to jump right into Titus chapter 2. We're going to go through the whole thing. We're going to read every verse. Um, we're not going to preach on every verse, but we're going to read every verse. And, and I hope that you'll be able to see some, some really cool things that every person in the room ought to be able to latch onto today as we look at this. So let's start off with verse 1. Uh, Titus chapter 2 verse 1 says, you, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. Now, it doesn't seem like a big verse, but what he's doing is he's transitioning, right? So he just said, here's what elders and leaders ought to do, and then here's what the false teachers are doing, and he goes, but you, you, Titus, you've got to teach what's appropriate to sound doctrine. Um, have, you ever, have you ever been surprised by a, uh, a diet or a fast? Like, have you ever done a diet or, or, or gone on a fast or something, and then you've been shocked by its results. You've been shocked at how good you feel, right? I mean, this happened to me the last fast. I mean, honest to God, I felt better physically, emotionally, and spiritually than I had in years during that fast, and it blew my mind. I was just shocked by it, but it's not really something I should be shocked by at all. I mean, it, it should not be a surprise because we know that healthy stuff in equals health. We know that. We know that healthy eating contributes to healthy living, and so I don't know necessarily know why that would be such a shock to us when we actually do those things. Like, you know, when they tell you to drink water and you're like, uh, if you're like me, you're just a big redneck and you're like, uh, you know, sweet tea is primarily water. It's the number one ingredient. The number one ingredient in Mountain Dew is water, all right? I mean, and then high fructose corn syrup is its brother. But you know what I mean. They're right in there together. But when you do drink water, you're astonished, or at least I am, by how much it makes you feel better, how different things are, how stuff doesn't hurt as much as it did before, how things get regular, if you know what I mean. Like, it's just amazing. But we should know that that's not, the, we should know why that's happening, because healthy in means health. And we know that healthy eating contributes to healthy living. When Paul talks about sound doctrine, I want you to understand this. When he's saying sound doctrine, everything he says captures this idea of health, every bit of it. And so if you're ever thinking of, and I, and I think like this, if you're ever thinking of what is it to be a healthy Christian, like how, should I, how can I be a healthy Christian, everything Paul says in the book of Titus has this sense of health in it when he's referring to doctrine. And so <clears throat> there's a healthy diet that healthy disciples eat. And so in other words, if you put the right things in, then the right outcomes happen. 
If you put the right things in, then you see the right results out. And that's the exact concept we've been saying the whole time about every good work comes from the good gospel, right? So what you put in, then it dictates what comes out. Healthy doctrine is the healthy diet. It's the habitual diet of healthy disciples. If you will chew on, eat, really, really dive into healthy doctrine of the gospel and make it a habit, then you will become a healthy disciple. And that's really Titus's, I mean, excuse me, Paul's big, big thing to Titus as he's setting the church up. Because, I mean, let's, let's look at it. Paul is giving advice to Titus who's setting up this church network on this island of Crete. I mean, the whole point is, is as fast as possible is not get the church as big as possible, right? We know that that doesn't always work. That doesn't always last. It's not to get the church um, as rich as possible because we know most of the time when Christians get a bunch of money, they hold on to it anyway. And so the cemetery fund would be huge when the youth ministry is over here in the basement. That's what usually happens, right? So it's not to get them physically, uh, it's, not, it's not to get them with a, with a physical budget that's good, it's to get them healthy. That's the overall goal, is to have be healthy disciples. And so there's two ways to look at this word diet when we see it. Like when you hear the word diet, do you think something I do for 30, 60, 90 days, it's a fad, you do it during this time frame and then it goes away? Or... The real way to look at the word diet is it's this overall way of life. You know, it's this diet that's continuous. And so we're talking about being healthy Christians. It's a continuous diet of healthy doctrine, a continuous diet of correct gospel, not just something you come into church on and snack on a little bit on Sunday and then put back down the rest of the week, not something that you do for a couple of months until something happens in your life and then you kind of disappear from it and you come back. That will lead to an unhealthy Christian, and I see it every day. And so the goal is, is to be able to snack on it, eat on it all the time. And so it creates health in us and being a healthy disciple. And so it's an overall way of life kind of diet that we're thinking of right now. So what he's going to do is he's about to address healthy disciples, and he's going to do it in different groups. And so we're going to look at all those groups. We're going to look at five different groups today. Let me show you verse 2. <clears throat> Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. Now, we know the older men in the group are not right now are not going to take notes, so the older women in the church that are married to them are probably taking notes for them right now. It's usually how it goes. Notice what it says. Let me read it one more time. To the older men, so there's our first group, be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and endurance. So older men, typically 50 to 60 years old, more than likely grown children, more than likely, early empty nest. That's kind of what we're talking about. It's the age group that, we're, that he's referring to when he says older men. He gives three marks of maturity in here, in this one verse, and three marks of godliness. There's three different types of things for maturity and then three marks of godliness. If you look at the first part of the verse, you'll see the three marks of maturity. It says temperate, worthy of respect, <clears throat> and self-controlled. Temperate, sober-minded, right? Sound mind, sober mind, clean mind. Worthy of respect, <clears throat> self-controlled. Those are three marks of maturity. Those are three marks that ma mature men should have in the church. These men have substance about them. There's more to them than just the things that you might necessarily classify a man. There's more to them than their hobbies or their jobs or their bank accounts. There's more to them than who they're dating or what car they're driving. There's substance to them. <clears throat> they are anchored in the faith. Like they're not going anywhere. They're there. And so storms have come and storms have gone in their life, but they're still there. They're anchored to it. These men have walked through seasons of, of having a family. They've suffered some sort of loss. And they came to the other side of it, and they can faithfully say to us, Church, our God is faithful. It, he, it's worth it to follow him in the end. You don't want to give up in the early phases. It's worth it because I'm anchored now. So when those storms have come and those seasons of life, you know, it's not always a storm. Sometimes it's just a life season. You know, sometimes raising, raising little kids can feel like a storm every day. It's really not. It's just a season of life. Sometimes having teenagers can feel like a, a storm. It's not a storm. It's just a season of life. And so they're anchored in that. Well, you'll notice that the next part, it starts to talk about godliness stuff. So that's maturity. But now look at godliness. Look at the rest of, of verse 2. Sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. This is our godliness stuff. Now, 
What you just saw is what is referenced as uh, Paul's cardinal virtues. They pop up in a lot of his writing. And you'll notice, like, the one you'll think of, when I say, <coughs> when I say what they are, faith, love, and endurance, right? Endurance, hope, same thing. Faith, love, hope. The first thing you think of is 1 Corinthians 13. Those are known as his cardinal values, right? There's faith, there's hope, the greatest of these is love. You know what I'm talking about. You've read that before. You've heard it at weddings. And so these pop up a lot with Paul's writing. In this case, we see these marks of godliness as faith, love, and endurance. That's where we throw our hope in at. Like, you can mature. You can be mature and not be godly. You can have the marks of self-control and solid and good temperament, sober-mindedness, and not be godly. But for a healthy church, what we need is maturity and godliness in men. We need both of those two things. Not just some mature men, but some godly men. I would actually kind of push out there, and this is not scripturally based, but you can, you can just take it for Adam Cookism. I would say that if you don't add the godliness in there, you really don't get maturity in the first place. Most of the men I know that are um, highly mature are highly godly. It usually goes together. I don't know about women, but it tends to go together like that with men. What happens is, is we, learn, we learn maturity from these men. We learn how to be mature men from these men. We learn how to have sound faith. We learn how to love, how to take care of other people, how to take care of folks, how to provide. We, we learn that from them. We learn endurance. This is a cool one. This is a key one. Um, this is one why I really lately, in the last couple of years, have really tried my best to spend time with men in this age group is because we learn, we learn endurance. We learn how to finish strong, right? We learn how to finish strong, not, not start off real strong and then just peter out in the middle. We learn how to finish strong, and that's what we're getting from them. That's what mature men are supposed to do. And so he's telling, he's telling Titus, you know, make, make sure that you're feeding into this. This is what mature men are supposed to look like. And so we're teaching our older men to actually be this, to actually live this, to actually act like it. Maturity and godliness. Look at verse 3. We're going to switch to another group. <clears throat> Verse 3 says, Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much, mi to, to much wine, but to teach what is good. Now, this is a really good verse. Um, it may not sound like it at first, but it's a really good verse. Pay attention to when he uses the word likewise. So he's going to use the word likewise a couple of times in here in this, in this uh, chapter, also in chapter 3. He's going to use the word similarly a couple of times in here. And when you, I want you to see that because when he says that, he's, making, he's, he's letting you know that what he's saying for the women here is very similar to what he's saying with the men. It's just kind of flowing through, right? It's, it's this healthy doctrine, understanding the gospel leads to good actions, and that's flowing through all of this along with the women. So it's not just the men do this and the women can't do those things that the men are doing. That's not what it means. That likewise is in there saying this is kind of similar to it. And in those women, he starts to mention those things. And so let me read that verse one more time. It says, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live. Let's start off with that one. Reverence here carries the, <clears throat> the sense of a priestess. Right? It, it's, it's quite holy is what I'm trying to say. Reverence here is saying that the way you are living gives off an air of sacredness. So as you look at an older woman, and this is what you kind of feel when you get around Holy Grandma, right? I mean, don't you? When you get around the matriarch of the family, the Holy Grandma, who's been through it all with Grandpa. You know how crazy Grandpa was back in the day, but they're still together, and you think he's awesome, but his kids, eh, not so much, because he's kind of grown into it. But she's held the household down, and she's held firm, and she's been sending everybody to Bible school since they were kids, and her Bible's on the side table, and it looks all beat up, and she's quoting Scripture at you all the time, and she's just loving and guiding. No matter what comes her way, there's this sense of reverence to it. That's kind of what it's talking about here. When it, when it references this about women, it, it means that, you, that your life is giving off this air of sacredness. It's like when you get around grandma, you kind of want to take your shoes off. You're getting around some holy ground or something. And that's what it means, ladies. And so why is he talking about wine here? Because all of a sudden he kind of transitions into not to be taking much wine and slandering. Why is he talking about wine? All right, so same age group as the men. So... 50s, 60s, somewhere around in there, right, in that time frame. Maybe a little younger than that for that age group back then, for that time frame that they were in, but you know what I mean. Empty nesters could have had um, 
<clears throat> at this point, grown kids, grown and out of the house. And so what's happened is, is mama has picked up a little me time, is what's happened. Because the kids are kind of gone, and hubby might still out be out working or whatever, and she's picked up a little me time. And so apparently what they were doing in this particular culture is they were getting together with some wine and a cheese platter or something and sitting around slandering. Now when I say that, you go, wow, that, they were gossiping. They were, they were gossiping. All right, so we've got to be real careful with just putting the word gossip in for slander. Just because gossip sounds better to you, don't substitute it for slander. Because slander is exactly what we're doing when we're sitting around gossiping. Almost always, we are, we are handing off something as truth that is probably a lie, but we don't really know that. And so don't, 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 just, don't just use the word gossip to kind of cover up the fact that it's a deeper sin than that. Apparently there was some slander here going on, and slander is serious. Slander is, is, comes from the word where we get the word devil from. It's serious. In other words, a slanderer is attacking with words or with lies. It's like a, the word slanderer is kind of a picture of a mini devil. So it's a big, big deal. And so kind of that might have been what they were doing at this point. I think we think that's the context that they were getting together and they were doing a lot of gossip and a little talking. He's going, no, 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 no. See, we're called to a higher standard than that. That's not gossip. That's slander. That's from the devil. We don't do those things. We don't sit around hurting, about, hurting other people with those things. And Paul is saying to them, two older women in particular, that there's a better way. There's a better way than that. You are to teach what is good. Did you see that in the scripture? It said you are to teach what is good. That teach what is good thing is extremely unique to this particular set of scripture. Really, really, really unique. And, and I don't know if I, I think it's the only time in all of scripture where you see this teach what is good thing used as an adjective. Only time anywhere. And so in other words, uh, ladies, that is, um, <clears throat> that is unique among you, that he would say that you are to teach what is good. What he's talking about, ladies, is human flourishing. He's talking about us as people flourishing and growing in what is good. I mean, think about a garden that flourishes. There's a lot of benefit that that gives to the world. And so what he's saying to you, older ladies in this context here, is you are kind of in charge, you're leading the way in human flourishing. Like this is on you. You lead human flourishing. And that's pretty intense. And I got to think about this a lot over the last several weeks and months, and I think it's absolutely spot on. Because I think, ladies, in you there is something that you lead human flourishing in us as families. You do it in churches. You do it in school systems and workplaces. And there's just something about you that is leading to the overall development of the people that are around you. Helping things grow. There's a big part of nurturing that goes into what he's saying here. Teach them what that what is good. There's human flourishing that happens in there. And then, and then ladies, you're kind of in charge of that. That's your thing which is pretty amazing. It's pretty, it's pretty cool. It's also quite a load to hear, uh, carry, so good luck, but it's, it's pretty cool. I mean, think about it so far. If, if so far all we had was older men who were marked by maturity and godliness, and we had older women that were teaching that what was just good, they were leading the family, the church, all the environments that they're in, in people flourishing and doing the best that they can and just nurturing in that. Man, we'd be killing it, wouldn't we? We'd be killing it. If you're thinking to yourself, man, that'd be nice to have, that just means there's a deficit in that. And I actually think there's a big deficit in that in our country, in our church world in particular. Because there's, um, there's been a gap. There's been a separation now for several, several years in the church world where the church didn't grow for a while. And then all of a sudden it starts to kind of pick up steam. And I'm not talking about an individual church, but the greater church in general and so you've got young people that are coming, and the church starts to switch its music styles around because it hung on to the last style for a long time. And then when it does that, then you've got this gap. You've got this younger crew that's coming in, and you've got this older crew that's over here. And so what ends up happening is, is you've got this kind of almost headbutting going on instead of those older people saying, hey, we're going to really make sure that these cats flourish. We're going to make sure that they 
have a men to look up to. And then the same thing with the younger crowd has, has not been inclined to actually look for that in them. This has been kind of a problem. But those are two of the groups. Let's look at the third one. Look at uh, verses 4 through 5. Verse 4 says, they can, Then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and, and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their husbands, so that no one will malign the word of God. Young women got more stuff mentioned to them than any of them. So if you're in that category, you get a whole lot of scripture just now. Young women, in this case, are talking about ones that are more than likely are married, more than likely have children at home, not necessarily, but they have school-age type children at home. That's the kind of group it's talking about. And the order here is real important. It, it, the first thing it says is that you're going to first order your hearts then order your homes. Do you notice that in the scripture? First order your hearts, then order your homes. I mean, that goes with the entire theme of the, of the book that we've been reading so far. It goes with what we know it's supposed to be like to be a Christ follower, that our hearts get ordered before our actions do. Our hearts get ordered before anything we're responsible for ordering gets ordered. And so in this case, it's first order your hearts, then order your home. The first order your heart is learning to love your family. It's learning to love your husband. It's learning to love your children. Now, their context was quite different. So if you're thinking, well, I, I don't need to learn him. I married him because I did love him, right? I, you know, well, I would push back and say, you probably still have a whole lot of learning to love to do with him because I'm one, and I know that I make my wife constantly learn to love me, right? I, like, I make it my mission in life sometimes for her to have to learn to love me on this particular week or day or month or year or whatever it is. In their context, you know, for us, we probably uh, sought out the person that we were dating, or they sought us out. We said yes to dating them. We dated them. We said yes to marrying them. We married them. Like, we chose them, and they chose us. So if you're mad at anybody, be mad at yourself. You picked him. But we picked them. In, in their context, they didn't. Most of these marriages were arranged. And so when he's talking to these young ladies, he's saying, you've you got to first order your heart, Right? you got to learn to love Jesus. you got to learn your love of your heart. you got to learn to love your husband, learn to love your family, learn to love this situation that you're in because they had to kind of pick that up on the fly, on the go. <clears throat> Let me say something about young women here because this scripture talks a lot about that. Um, there is nothing more life-giving. Nothing. I don't think, and, and I've racked my brain over this to make sure that I'm actually saying this true, you know, truly, there is nothing more life-giving than a wife who loves me, a wife who, um, <clears throat> that I know she is for me, that she respects me, that she cares for me, that she champions me, that she applauds me, that she also speaks harshly to me sometimes. I don't think there's anything more life-giving than that. That's kind of that's the proof in the pudding that women do have a lot to say and lead the way in human flourishing as they get older because there's nothing, there's nothing more life-giving than a wife, a woman who does these things. See, Val thinks I hung the moon, but she knows that I didn't. She thinks that I'm the greatest, and she knows that I'm not. And there's something very life-giving about that. There is a push to be better, but a recognition that you ain't all that. Like, if you ever wanted real, honest criticism, you get that from your spouse, you get that from your wife. If I want to know how my message really was, I ask her. Because there ain't a piece of me that impresses her. She knows all the dirt and all the garbage. So I really want to know how a message is. I don't ask you. You always say yes. I ask her. The question here that will pop up in your mind in this particular scripture, because if you read it again, I'll read part of it again. It says, love their husbands and children, then going into five, self-controlled and pure to be busy at home, to be kind and to be subject to their husbands. Um, when you get to this part, it's really easy to ask the question, am I sinning then if I'm not a stay-at-home mom who's underneath my husband's thumb? Because somebody thought that today when we read that scripture just now. Busy at home, subservient to your husband. And so are you sinning if, you are not, if you're working outside the house and you've got a career and a job and you're not under your husband's thumb? No, the phrase really means that you are to be the manager of the home. You're the manager of it. 
You're the guide of the home. Here's a really good way to put it. You're the steward of the home. You steward it. And that is so true. It's so true. You steward and manage the food. I don't mean you cook it. I mean you manage it. What we got around the house is probably because you bought it. And you figured out which place you had to go get it to be the cheapest, even if it involved having to rent a grocery cart, which I absolutely refuse to do. You decide on, you're managing the clothes that are in the home, right? I don't wear anything unless my mama or my wife buys it for me, right? Case in point, she bought this shirt. You manage all the pieces of the comings and goings, and there's a stewardship of management there that men cannot do. We can, we can fill in when we need to, and we can buck up sometimes and just have to do it because there's no choice. I know there's men that have to do those things. But you're the manager, the steward of the home is what it's talking about. The point of this is not that you can't do this while working outside of the home. The point of it is that your heart would be first for the home, that that's our focus. And so what we do outside of the home is also helping to build what's inside the home. I mean, if you don't believe me, if you think that women cannot work outside the home and have to be subservient to men in that way and that I'm interpreting Scripture wrong, go read Proverbs 31 and we can talk later. Because Proverbs 31 talks about the greatest woman ever made, basically. And guess what she does? She works outside the home. Matter of fact, the way that's worded in Proverbs 31, she's probably making more money than, than old, old Proverbs 31 husband is, right? Young moms, let me say something to you before we move on to the next group. Um, Thank you for what you do. We as men could never do what you do, ever. When there's times when my wife's out of town or something and I have to do these things, there ain't really no flourishing going on. We make get by, but we could never do what you do. The weight that I feel as a parent, right, the weight that I feel raising these three kids, it's ten times that amount for my wife. It's 10 times that amount for mama than it is for dad. So moms, you make an investment that goes way beyond even what you know. You have no clue the investment that you're making in the world, in the kingdom. You have no idea. And I'll tell you how we see this as a church. We will watch people come in who have been raised by godly parents. I don't want to diminish you know, diminished dad. We talked about how important dad was last week. But particularly a godly mother. And especially godly grandmothers. We'll watch those people come to the church. And not always, but a lot of times, they just have a different investment level than other people do. There's a different starting point that they have. There's a different level of kingdom-mindedness that sometimes goes along with those Christians. And so, I want you to know that, that while you may feel day in and day out like this, is, this job's getting nowhere and it's never doing anything and it's thankless and it's payless and all those things. No, 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 it has an amazing payout. It's just not going to happen till glory. It's an amazing payout. There's so many people in the church that are in leadership positions that are leading others to Christ all the time and a lot of that started with you. Now Paul's going to move on to the younger man and you're going to think this one's funny because we just had a really long verse for the, for the young women right? And a pretty good sized verse for the older women, even though they got fussed up for drinking too much wine and cheese. And then also uh, a pretty long verse for the old men. Now look what he says to the younger men, verse 6. Similarly, now remember that word there. We'll come back to it. Encourage the young men to be self-controlled. That's all they get. First time I read this, because I would be qualified in that young man category, I know, which is awesome. Uh, probably not quite, but you know there. I'm there. Um, and I was like, dang. That's not right. Gave all the young moms all this stuff, you know, so that you kind of know what you're doing right. You know, it's, it, for, for somebody that likes checklists, I actually like checklists. All I got is one on there. And I get to this one, and it gets to young men, and the only thing he's telling us to do is to get it together. Right? Be self-controlled. Get it together, son. And I'm like, man, that's not fair. But there is a lot more to it than that because you've got that word there, that similarly word, that likewise word that's referencing back up to everything that's been mentioned before. This is all building blocks, all, all stepping stones. But let's talk about that self-controlled thing real quick. Be self-controlled. Young men, be self-controlled. As funny as is when I say young men right now, you're going to disqualify yourself. 
Um, you're going to think of teenagers. You're going to think of 20-somethings. It's pretty much talking to young dads right here. And you're not a young dad based on your age. You're a young dad based on the kids that you have's age. Be self-controlled. God wouldn't have said that if it wasn't possible. It is possible for you to control yourself. By God's grace and through the power of the Holy Spirit, self-control is attainable and it is achievable. Now, you can't do it on yourself, on your own. Self-control is not something that you do. Self-control, we know, is it, is a, it is a fruit of the Spirit. It flows out of a heart that's yielded to the Spirit. You're never going to be self-controlled in your actions, right? And, and this goes with the whole theme of Titus. In your actions, you're never going to be self-controlled unless your heart is yielded over to the Holy Spirit. Unless your heart is chewing on healthy intake every day, all the time, of healthy doctrine of Jesus. It's the only way you can get self-controlled. I mean, I, I literally have to read some Jesus every day to keep from punching somebody or going to jail or shutting this church down. You know what I mean? Like, every day. It doesn't come on your own. It is a fruit of the Spirit, which means it is done through you, but not by you. Fruits of the Spirit are done through you. But they're not done by you. They're done by the Holy Spirit. So how is the Holy Spirit going to do those things in you, through you, unless you are spending time with them? Unless you are invested in Unless you are seeking to be, to be led by the Spirit? Self-control is attainable. It's achievable. Through the Holy Spirit, in you, by your tethering to the gospel of Jesus. Look at 7 and 8. 7 says, in everything set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching show integrity and seriousness and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Now what he's doing here is he's talking kind of to Titus specifically about his example that he leads as a young man. That's why he references Titus here right after he's talked about young men, because Titus is a young man. So he's talking about how Titus would give an example to young men as a young man. So he's absolutely saying right here that young men can be an example and should be an example to other young men. I would say this to the young guys that are present today, the young guys that are at church, rise up. It's not only older people who can be an example. It's you too. When I was a young man, most of the people I looked up to were young men. So rise up. He's saying, Titus, you set the example here. You set the tone. You're a young man, so you're going to do these things, and you're going to be an example for these young men to follow. And so it might be time for some young men to actually step up. That's one of the worst things that's happening in our country right now. And don't get me on this kick, because I'll end up talking about it and say the same joke that I've said millions of times about Cheetos in the basement and all that kind of stuff. But that's one of the worst things that's happening in our country right now is this, this failure to launch thing going on where we've got men sitting around who are men, grown men, who's still on mom and daddy's health insurance and late in the 20s and you're not working jobs and still hanging out at colleges for 29 years. You know what I mean? That's one of the biggest issues. And so young men step up and be an example for other young men to follow is what it's saying here. He's telling Titus to do that too. Notice what's missing from this list so far. Notice what's missing. Nothing about talents. Nothing about gifting. Nothing about career Nothing about what type of job or education you have. None of those things. That's not been listed at all. Why would we want to follow this man or this woman? Because they're godly. Not because of their gifting or their talents. You want to be like the example that's being set. Because Mark, mark it down. He's not just telling these people to do this because they should do it. It's because this is how the church grows. This is how the church gets healthy. Older men are doing these things. That's giving an example to other older men, also to younger men. Older women are doing these things. That's giving an example to other older women, also to younger women. Younger men are doing these things, which is giving an example to younger men, but also children. Younger women are doing these things, which is giving an example to other mothers and other young women, but also to children. I mean, it all is kind of flowing together here. 
You want to be like this man or this woman because they're godly, not because they have some awesome talent. It's something I want you to see before we wrap this up, and we still got quite a bit of verses to read, but we're not talking about them a lot. Um, something I want you to see bef- that we often miss as a church. The ownership for discipleship falls on the membership. The ownership for discipleship falls on the membership. If you read what I just said, the whole ownership for discipling young men, old men, young women, old women, it's all falling on the discipleship of the church. When he tells Titus to set an example for young men, he's not saying do that as the pastor. He's saying do that as a young man of the church. Discipleship is not simply a pastor-elder issue alone. If you're part of this congregation... You are part of the maturation, the development, and the discipleship of this congregation. If you're going, well, I'm not really doing anything. We know. It can tell. That's why there's no maturity. That's why there's some void of maturity around you. That's why there's holes in discipleship systems. That's why, that, that's why we have more people tithing in the church than we do in a small group, which is absolutely ridiculously stupid. The discipleship, it falls on the membership of the church. It's everybody's job, every Christian's job in the greater church to mature and develop other Christians. Let's look at 9 through 10. Here's another group. This is the last group. Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them, and not to steal from them, but to show them they can be fully trusted so that in every way they will make <clears throat> the teaching about God, our Savior, attractive. All right, so slave here, referring to a bond servant, that's someone whose livelihood, whose possessions were dictated by somebody else. Slavery. Now, when we hear this in our context, we think of Americanized colonization slavery. So we think of it very much based on race. This one was not. This was mostly debt-induced slavery, debt-induced bond servant. And so it was based on you owed money, you worked it off, this is how you did it. Now, it really wasn't about race. I mean, it, that, that whole debt-induced thing covered everybody from all different walks of life. Now, that doesn't make it any better. I'm not saying that that makes like this is biblical slavery is correct. That, that's not what I mean. It doesn't make it any better. And I don't have time to go into slavery right now, but I do want to say a couple of things. Racial prejudice is still extremely active and well in this country. And it is something that as a church we should detest and speak prophetically into. Like we should detest it. This is a spot where we should be righteously angry about it. And we should speak prophetically into it. We should speak the healing name of Jesus over the despicable racism that happens in our community all the time. Christians, above all else, should know that every single soul is, it matters to God deeply. And there is no differentiation between who Christ died for and who he didn't. There's no levels to that. We should know that, and so we should detest it and speak against it. And let me just, let me just say one quick thing. Most of where you're going to need to detest it is in your own heart. Most of the places where you may not tell nobody, you know, I know you don't like the stuff on Facebook when you see it and you just kind of leave it alone. You may not tell anybody, but there's something that's kind of in you and you've got to detest that piece of you. It's got to be put to death. You've got to submit it over to the Lord and speak prophetically into that. Speak the blood of Jesus over it, that it can be healed, it can be removed, and we can see people through the eyes of Christ, just like he sees us. What Paul is really saying here, and I don't have time to get into the slavery part, but what Paul is really saying here is despite your hardship, despite your difficult situation, even if you're stuck in one that's outside of your control, you are to be trustworthy, you are not to be argumentative. In other words, what should be evident in you is the gospel of Christ, that you are changed to the core. That even in a situation that is against you, that is oppressive against you, you still are a person that is changed to the core by Jesus. And you begin to see that kind of come out in them. Let's look at the last few verses, 11 through 15. For the grace of God has appeared, 
that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. These, then, are the things you should teach. Encourage and rebuke with all authority. Don't let anybody despise you. That's chapter 2. What makes us different, church? What makes us different? What Paul just said in verses 11 through 15, and I wish I had time to preach on them all day, but I don't. What he just said to you is he said what makes us different. What makes us different? What is the healthy doctrine that we are to digest and consume? What makes us different is Jesus. That is what makes us distinctly different from the rest of the world. It's Jesus. Every good work that we do is based on the good, good gospel of Jesus. What makes the church different from the American Red Cross? They do some amazing work. They raise some amazing money. They have tons of volunteers. They've even got small groups. Did you know that? What makes us different than the American Red Cross? What makes us different than the Danville Neighborhood Development Corporation that we've partnered with? Good organization, doing some good things. What makes us different? It's Jesus. That's what sets our good works aside. That's what sets us up to do them. That's why we get out of bed in the morning. That's why we give. That's why we serve. That's why we lay down our lives. That's why we would sit down and think, what do I need to be as an older person? What do I need to be as a younger person? How do I serve? How do I pay attention to who's in leadership and who's not and who's teaching me? That's why we pay attention to all those things. What makes us different is Jesus. And that's the thing where you don't just start grabbing at the church does some good stuff. No, no, no. The church has a good Savior. That's what we cling to first. That's what makes the works happen in the first place. I had an awesome opportunity. I want to share this story with you. It's not in the notes, but I had an awesome opportunity um, last year to sit across a campfire with um, Wes Stafford for about four or five days. Wes Stafford is now the current is currently the president emeritus of Compassion International. But he served as the president and acting CEO for 35 years. Started working there in 1977 when Compassion was this little storefront, this little storefront place that rescued a couple thousand kids. And see Wes had this amazing history in his life that God had just set up where he had watched this go down because he was a missionary's child that was raised in Africa around all this poverty. And so he was constantly watching his friends die as a kid. But he didn't die because he was a white missionary's son. So they had the stuff they needed. But he watched his friends die. And then Jesus took and turned that into... God took and turned it into a lifelong ministry. And so I'm sitting across from him, and he tells us this story. And, and, and he says that there was this moment in Compassion's history where it had grown tremendously, right? But it had kind of plateaued. It had gotten to a spot where it wasn't really doing anything. And they brought in some consultants and all these things. And the consultants' big thing was, this thing will explode. You could rescue every kid on the planet if you just took that Jesus name out of the title. And so they pulled back and... They kind of weighed their options. So, I mean, you know, we'd really be hitting it, and we can still say Jesus. We should put him in the title. And Wes said there was this defining moment where he and a couple other guys said, no, we ain't doing that. Matter of fact, what we'll do instead is we'll double down on the name of Jesus instead. So what we'll do is we won't just keep it in our, in our title. We'll make it bigger. We'll make it absolute. See, it used to just kind of be there. It was a tagline that was sometimes in, in, their, um, in, in their title slides and in their, in their logos and stuff, and they said, no, no, we're going to integrate it into it all the way. So in, in other words, it says, compassion, rescuing children out of poverty in Jesus' name. After that, they doubled the amount of kids that they had rescued all over the world. 
See, it's, it's Jesus that makes us different. It's Jesus that pushes us to be different. It's Jesus that pushes us to be better. It is not just the goal of doing good things. It's not just the goal of being a good husband. It's not just the goal of being a good wife or a grandma. It's Jesus. He's the difference. And so we tie our hearts to the gospel. We tie it to it so that it makes the needed changes. And then it does what the king of the universe tells it to do. And the outcome of that can't be measured in earthly ways. Just like with compassion. All of a sudden, adding the name of Jesus should have tanked it. But guess what it did instead? It increased it dramatically, unexplainably. That's what happens when we tie our hearts to the gospel. It's all about Jesus. That's what makes us different. And so as we close and pray today, I want to ask you that question, Right? Is that what makes you different? Because I think what, what, what may be going on today as you sit here and you listen to this message is, is that you're going, man, I really want a relationship with Jesus like that. Well, you can have one. And so submit to him today. I'm already a Christian out of my no, but it don't sound like you've submitted, though. It don't feel like you've submitted. So you may have accepted him as your Savior, but have you submitted to this, his life and, 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 and this diet of healthy gospel? Not some fad diet. Not some little snack today and a little snack tomorrow and then forget about it for a while and then get back on the Jesus scale and realize you hadn't really done anything. Like, have you submitted to being under his authority and growing in him? So what Paul shows in that scripture is this past grace that rescued us. He shows the present grace that transforms and renews us and, and redeems us and changes us. And then he shows the future grace that reassures us. That's the grace we want to step into all the time. Let me pray with you real quick if you bow your heads. Lord, we love you today. We worship you, Father. God, I just ask you to do work in our hearts right now as we close, Father, just to do work in our hearts. Wherever we are, wherever we're listening at, God, that you right now would just pull us to you. If there's someone in here who doesn't know you as their Savior, like today's the day where they submit to your authority. Their lives get handed over to you right here, right now. But then there's a bunch of Christians that are listening to me today. There's a bunch of people that have submitted their, their, themselves over to you, that you own them, you possess them, and you're cleaning them up. But maybe they're tethering themselves a little too much to maturity and not enough to godliness. Maybe they're tying themselves a little too much to being good and doing good works and less to the gospel of Jesus. But I pray right now that, that if that's you, you'll just say, God, I submit to this. I want you to lead my path. I want to chow down on the good gospel of Jesus. What makes me different is not how good I am. It's not my gifts or my talents. It's not my employment, the money I have, the car, homes, anything that I possess. What makes me different is Jesus. Lord, I want to be submitted to that fully, to good, sound doctrine. We love you, Lord. May you work in our hearts today as we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.